Stay tuned for today's episode of Breaking the Biz, an informative podcast where we dive into the world of entertainment by interviewing seasoned professionals who have made their mark in the industry. Gain invaluable insights as they share their personal journeys, offering advice on navigating the dynamic landscape of the entertainment industry. Whether you're an aspiring actor, musician, filmmaker, author, animator, or any creative soul, tune in for expert career guidance, insider tips, and firsthand accounts on breaking into the entertainment industry. Get ready to unlock the secrets behind successful careers and fuel your own passion for the limelight. Please remember to like this video and to subscribe to our channels for more great conversations. Greetings from Breaking the Biz, brought to you by Yes I Can, Unity Through Music and Education. I'm William Felber, your navigator through the intriguing universe of the entertainment industry, as revealed by the visionaries and creators who bring it to life. Stay tuned as we delve into diverse insights from the forefront of entertainment, hearing from pioneers, creators, and agents of change. Prepare for a journey filled with tales of innovation, resilience, and the undying quest for artistic brilliance. And welcome to Breaking the Biz podcast with the Yes I Can crew. We have got a great guest with us tonight. We have Mr. Dylan Evans, uh, who is a show caller and a stage manager, currently resides in Las Vegas, uh, recently working in the greater China and the Middle East. His experience abroad have allowed him to work, grow, and most importantly, uh, lead fun. As a show caller with shows including Awakening at the Wind, Apps at uh, Caesar's Palace, and the House of Dancing Water at the City of Dreams, Dylan works with to create a safe, consistent, and inclusive workplace for all staff and performers. Uh, additionally, Dylan has been on the management teams with the World Fair, Expo 2020, Dubai, uh, on their Asia tour, Five Currents, and Thinkwell Group in Los Angeles. Some of his previous internships include Michael Jackson's One by Cirque du Soleil, MTV Television Network, Walking with Dinosaurs, The Arena Spectacular, and the old Golden Globe Theater. Uh, Dylan received his bachelor's in stage management from the California Institute of Arts and also graduated from the technical theater program from the Coronado School of Arts in San Diego. He's passionate about providing in-depth resources and educational opportunities to artists on all levels. So, Dylan, I want to, first of all, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. For sure. I'm happy to be here with you guys. Awesome. You know, we were joking uh, initially looking at the calendar behind you, but I, I can tell that that is like... A, a masterpiece of putting pieces in everything where they go it, it is, is like an entire year of shows that you're working on break that down for me <clears throat> cool so absinthe is the show i'm at now <clears throat> and we are in a spiegel tent which is like an old-fashioned circus tent right in front of caesar's palace in las vegas and we run seven days a week 365 there's not a single night that we don't have a show so even on christmas and thanksgiving and st patrick's day or fourth of july we always have a show and we have a lot of artists to keep track of because we don't take days off altogether so this calendar kind of keeps track of who's off when and when they're on vacation. Um, we have one stage manager on our team named brian and he is the master of that calendar and and puts everything in there. So he stays on top of that. Um, and that's what that's keeping track of. Just artist vacations is only for that calendar. And we have a lot of other calendars for different things for performances and buyouts and costume fittings and rehearsals and all that. But that's just our vacation calendar. <laughs> That is uh, insane. So we're going to yeah. get into all of the skill sets that you bring in order to mastermind and lead a team on that level. I want to start very early, though. When you were when you were young, young in what was the dream job when you were like, when I grow up, I'm going to be. I wanted to be a stage manager for Cirque du Soleil. So, so the dream, the dream actually happened. Yeah, that was probably, I think, around seventh grade. Um, I wanted to work for Cirque du Soleil originally. I wanted to get into lighting design. Um, but I always knew I wanted to do entertainment and production. Um, I just I thought it would always be lighting. And then I found stage management, which we can get into in a little bit. Okay. Uh, through high school, were you involved in all yeah, the so I went shows? To performing arts. I went to a performing arts high school. 
Um, and I was in the technical theater program. And I went there thinking I would get into uh, lighting and lighting design. And I kind of wanted to always, you know, be with a concert or an artist or a band or a show and, and be running the light board and designing it. And at the time, I thought that there was someone kind of making it all happen. I didn't realize that cues were programmed. So I thought somebody was just kind of being able to be creative on the fly. And as I found out that lighting designers don't typically stay with the production long term, I realized I really wanted to be with the artists because I love their energy and I, I wanted to stay with the show and not necessarily leave it. And I got asked to be a stage manager um, my sophomore year of high school um, by one of the directors for a, a Shakespeare show. Had no clue what I was doing and just dove right into it. And that's how I got into stage management and then kind of uh, everything else blossomed from there. So talk me through, um, you, you do that in high school, you get offered, uh, is that like a, you're kind of like a, a first job type of thing where you were working on the Shakespeare as far as the lighting and, and production? Yeah, so that was actually all just a high school production um, as part of the School of the Arts and within my public high school. And um, we put on, I think, we put on at my high school about 60 shows a year. Um, everything from, you know, one night music performances to two week dance shows, two week musicals, that kind of thing. Um, and early on when I got asked to do that, that was kind of my first job, even though I was still a student, you know, I wasn't getting paid. Um, that was my first time stage managing. Um, and I was just an ASM under one of the, you know, the seniors at the time. Um, and she was kind of teaching me the ropes of what things were. And I had no clue. I'd never really worked in a, in a theater before, right? I was just a high school student. Um, um, I'd acted briefly as a kid, you know, within church productions or whatever it might be. But um, I only got into production really in high school. Okay. Talk me through the transition from high school to uh, attending CalArts here in Santa Clarita. So do most of you guys live in Santa Clarita? A majority of us are from awesome. Santa Clarita. And we have some students cool. actually who just joined who are graduates from CalArts. Amazing. Cool. Yeah, I, I loved CalArts. I actually went to a different college for a year up in, well, I'm going to go back for you. So in high school, you know, I got into stage management and I was like, dang, you know, I really like getting to work with the artists and um, I guess being as technical wasn't my thing, but I had a lot of management, you know, uh, desire, I guess, and um, a lot of people skills that just allowed me to really enjoy talking with people and kind of navigating shows and calling cues and, and fixing things on the fly. And I really thrived on that in high school. And I was like, you know, this would be cool. I wonder if I could ever make a career out of this. And started volunteering at various theaters in San Diego that were outside of um, outside of the high school um, that were you know regional uh, theaters that were professional and and they kind of just brought me in and I, I wrote a lot of them just online through their general you know emails I said hey I'm a high school student but can anybody train me you know I want to learn from a professional. And I wouldn't, you couldn't believe how many of those theaters actually took me on for either like a one week kind of experience or a couple brought me on as a crew member just to get to sit in the back and, and observe and learn. And that's how I got into that. And then through that, I realized I could go to college and make a career out of it. And then I started finding out that there were actually programs for stage management. I had no idea. No, I went to a performing arts uh, college fair in San Diego. Um, this uh, specific college fair is for um, colleges that offer art programs. So it might be theater or dance or music or visual arts or, or film. And all of those schools come together and go to different um, conference halls around the country and present their programs. And that's how I found CalArts and Cornish uh, College of the Arts in Seattle, where I ended up going my first year. And then I transferred down to CalArts for the remainder um, of my time as a bachelor and got my um, undergrad from CalArts and stage management. So I want to point out two things. A, when indeed they have those job fairs, there's a reason to go. Like I too had no clue that you could actually get a, a bachelor's in stage management. Yep. Uh, Al Arts has so many technical, cool uh, programs and such that they offer. Um, but I, I myself had no clue. So when indeed you guys see that stuff out there, there's a reason to go. Networking's important. And then obviously finding exactly where where you're going to fit in as far as education, highly important. So you, you take the trek all the way to Seattle. Um, 
pretty is is it a little culture shock uh, or just be, being in i think more of a, a weather shock is what weather shock me. i couldn't the weather because coming from san diego that was a big jump however i think it was really good for my first year of college to go further than just los angeles i think it was great for me to step out and really push me out of the house um you know out of san diego i, I grew up as a beach kid and um, it was great for me just to kind of push myself out of my comfort zone. I tried it for a year. I had to stick to it. I didn't, you know, I I knew I didn't like it right away, but I, I finished the whole school year. I went through the uh, application process to transfer and and made the move. Um, but it was a big jump going all the way to Seattle. It's still a city I love to go to. I actually went up um, for USATT, the big theater conference that we had um, a couple of months ago up there. But I love Seattle, but I think Los Angeles and being at CalArts was uh, more of what I wanted. And one thing I realized, too, when I was look looking for colleges, I think I realized this after the fact, going to a college in an area or part of the country that you see yourself living in is a really good thing. Like I knew I didn't want to be a Broadway stage manager. I don't have interest in that. But for people that want to be Broadway stage managers or work on Broadway, maybe going to a college on the East Coast might be a better idea for you because it allows you to make connections out there, know the theaters, know what the, um, you know, what the job market is like versus me in LA. You know, I knew I wanted to kind of stay in the West Coast area and getting to stay out here and go to CalArts and transferring down there versus Seattle allowed me to build my connections in the area that I that I ended up staying in. Okay, so let's talk about that transition. You come back to a beautiful Santa Clarita, not as nice as San Diego in any way, but but still close enough to L.A. Um, talk me how uh, amazing experience uh, CalArts was. CalArts was incredible. Um, it was a great spot for three years. You know, everybody, when they're a senior, they get tired. So, you know, by the end of the three years, I was ready to graduate but I learned so much and I feel like in college, especially arts programs, I've heard a lot of my friends say it is way more about the people that you meet and the connections that you make versus the education. Because everything that I've learned in stage management really comes from, you know, I got my base, my my core from my professors in college and, high, and my teachers in high school. But you learn so much more in the job market and exploring, getting to talk with other stage managers, and that's how you grow naturally. But CalArts really gave me a great launching pad to um, to kind of figure out what I wanted to do, you know, to take the time to meet other people. And again, I made so many connections, and a lot of the people I've graduated with, I'm still great friends with them, and a lot of them work Internationally, I see. I got to see a lot of them when I was living abroad. Um, I see a lot of them in Vegas now because they come in to, you know, uh, do lighting design for various shows or whatever it might be. But, um, but yeah, CalArts was incredible. It, it gave me the opportunity to really learn and grow. One thing um, that I didn't really re realize, CalArts didn't offer anything from musical theater. It was all straight. Uh, theater shows so there was no singing or dancing and looking back I think it would have been cool to kind of have my hands on bigger musicals but then CalArts did a lot of uh, interesting avant-garde kind of art which is kind of what I'm in now right I'm not in traditional theater now and maybe that what CalArts brought me was kind of showing me there's more than just musical theater there's more than just one type of Broadway show you can kind of do a lot with an entertainment and finding ways to branch out really helps you in your career. And then obviously with stage management, uh, you could go into running a venue if you were to work with like a Live Nation or I uh, thought about that, yeah, or, or like an AEG. You know, you have yep. that within uh, your wheelhouse. So exactly. I want to ask, uh, you know, you you mentioned in your bio uh, internships, you know, right away with Cirque du Soleil. I know that was the dream since age seven. Did Cal Arts help with internship? that internship opportunity was that your first internship so i had three internships during my time in college uh, the first one was right after my freshman year and that was with the old globe in san diego which is a tony nom tony award-winning uh, regional theater um, they've created a lot of shows like avenue q um, i think even rent had their original productions there um, they're very very well known and i just interned on a, sh on a show as an sm intern there 
I interned with MTV networks, trying the television thing. I didn't know if I would like it. And I was in the production management department, which is kind of the equivalent of stage management in a way. And then my final internship was with Cirque du Soleil. Now the common thing between all three of them, for me to get those jobs, I had to be enrolled in school. So I think that, you know, they, you either had to be in, you know, a junior college, a, uh, a bachelor, undergrad, or a grad school. So any of those three would give you kind of the, the check mark in order to say, hey, you're allowed to apply for these internships. And that's what allowed me to go into those three internships. Were those three internships, uh, was it paid or was it college credit? I actually, I think my first one at the Old Globe was unpaid at the time. I I know that with um, MTV Networks, with Viacom, and I suggest that all of you check out their internship program because they offered, they, they paid you as a paid internship program, and they had internships in so many different fields. Viacom is a company that owns Paramount, they own Nickelodeon, Cartoon Network, MTV. They own so many different things, and they have one website that gets you connected to all of those internships. So I highly suggest you check out Viacom, and those are all paid internships plus college credit if your college provides it. So I got both out of that, which was fantastic. So actually, when I was in Santa Clarita, I didn't even have a car because my car broke. I had to get to Santa Monica in the morning. I had to start at 8 a.m. I took the public bus from Santa Clarita for two hours to get down to UCLA, and I would walk for two miles, two or three miles to get to campus to work for MTV. So each day I was commuting, you know, three and a half, four hours just to work on this internship that I was doing three days a week with, again, my bosses. I'm still in, in connection with them. I never ended up going down the TV route, but the really good thing over those four months of interning with MTV, I realized, hey, I don't want to do TV because I know I like to be with the audience. I love to hear the live clapping. And I, I was able to find something out about myself and learn at the same time through that internship, which was incredible. I want to point out two things. One, uh, people who make excuses and are lazy. Uh, I think you have just completely shown them that you, if you want something, you figure out how to do it. Not having yeah. a car, taking two hours, you know, bus, walking two miles, making sure you're there on time. That's obviously dedication. And it just shows if you want something bad enough, you figure out how to do it. Mm. So I, I, I love that. The other piece and, and other guest speakers have talked about this. Um, it's a lot easier when you don't know exactly what you want to do to take on internships to go, ah, that's not for me. Like in your situation, I don't want to go the TV route. I love the live audience. I love that energy. Um, so, you know, it, it is important to get out there and, and try different things to lead you to exactly what it is you're perfect for and what you're passionate about. So, um, that's amazing when you were working at mtv uh, was there any was it a show you know you know you mentioned it was like production it was cool i was actually in the production management department for the whole network of live entertain like live tv uh for uh for vh1 so any television show that they were making whether it be scripted or reality or whatever like they were doing a reality show at the time similar to big brother and that was actually filmed in santa clarita so that was really cool because i was able to get to site really easy um but yeah uh that was all me kind of and again viacom knew i had i didn't i didn't bring anything to them that they I mean, they were there to simply help me learn and grow. And I got to do, you know, full budgeting exercises for full TV episodes, learning how much, you know, um, grips will cost and, and catering and, and transport and performers and how all that is done and actually having to work on a budget. I'd never done that before. And I think and it was a learning experience, right? It wasn't a real one, but my boss was like, hey, you have to do this. This is part of your internship. It's not actually going anywhere, but I need you to do this because you're going to learn something. And I, I was kind of dreading it because it was such a strenuous, intense project, but I learned a lot from it. Um, and that's what we were doing. So it was a lot of hands-on and kind of just a lot of getting to learn about how a TV network is run, um, getting to go talk with the casting department, see how casting was going for a TV show. Um, and they had interns in that department as well, which I thought was really cool. So, you know, there, there, there were a variety of interns and they put, a lot, put on a lot of meet and greets for us to get to know each other as well, um, who are people I still talk with today. 
So in hindsight, I mean, it really did prepare you for what you're doing now, you know, obviously having to deal with people's schedules, budgeting, catering, yeah. you know, uh, I totally. love it when it comes full circle. So now let's yeah. really talk full circle. The fact that at age seven, you knew exactly the company that you wanted to work for. Um, did you see a, a Cirque show when you were seven? What Which show yeah, did you my, see? It was called Kidam. Uh, it was a touring Cirque du Soleil show. And uh, that Cirque show came to San Diego and I saw it in the tent with my parents and I was like, oh, that's really cool. Um, I said, I'd love to be a part of that. And I, at the time at that age, was kind of thinking I'd be a performer and then, you know, naturally got into production, but still wanted to work for Cirque. And I applied to the internship program for Cirque all four years of college. And I, the first year, my freshman year, I got a call back, but didn't go anywhere. My second year, I had an interview, didn't go anywhere. Third year, I had two interviews, didn't go anywhere. And after my, my, my senior year of college, I remember talking to my mom and she's like, hey, are you gonna apply for the internship? I said, no, I'm not even gonna bother. It's, not, it's a waste of my time. She's like, you should apply. And I applied to the internship and I had, my, I had one interview and I was like, oh dang, I didn't even get my second interview. And then I remember I got the phone call uh, during my internship with MTV, actually. They called me while I was there. Um, and yeah, that's how I got that. And I think that I, I remember where I was when you get that call. I think it was just kind of one of those things that I just envisioned for so long. And funny enough, I only worked for Cirque for three months. I actually haven't worked for Cirque du Soleil, the company itself, since then. But still, I checked it off my bucket list, you know. And I think, um, yeah, I guess that answers the question that you were asking. No, I love it. So yeah. um, talk me through after working uh, and doing that for three months, is that, do you go right to Vegas from there? Yeah. So when I finished up college, um, my internship was the summer after college finished. So when I graduated, I went on a trip with my sister for a month and then I went right to Vegas and I'd never seen Michael Jackson one. It was one of the newer Cirque du Soleil shows in town at the time. And uh, my first day, they, they just had me go watch the show. And I remember just watching it going, dang, this is going to be a really cool three months. And I couldn't believe how fast that time flew by. It went so quick. Okay. So after that internship, talk me through, uh, you know, searching for the job. What, what comes next? Yeah. So I think, you know, during the internship, I was talking to my boss and said, you know, Hey, I, I really want to stay. I want to be in Vegas and I want to work here. And I remember he looked at me and he's like, Dilla, I'm not going to hire you. He said, you're not going to learn and grow just here in Vegas. He said, I'm going to push you away in a good way. I'm going to be the, you know, I'm going to give you the, the, the push you need. I'm not going to hire you to come work on this long running show. You need to go grow as a stage manager. There's so much more to learn and so much more to see. I'm not going to hire you. That's pretty much what he told me. And I was kind of heartbroken. I was like, dang, I just graduated. I need to find work. What am I going to do? And I applied kind of everywhere. And I remember thinking, Hey, you know, there was themed entertainment. A lot of Cal Arshans get into um, Disney and, and universal and themed entertainment. I was like, let me try this out. So I ended up applying to a company called think well group and they're based in Los Angeles and they do a lot of uh, theme park design ended up applying to them uh, and um, got a job. I was only, I was there for like four months on a project. Um, and again, realized it wasn't for me cause I was behind a desk the entire day, um, doing paperwork and meetings and it was still for entertainment, but it was different. Um, and then long story short, after that, I went to a, uh, nonprofit that my friend was working at in Arizona to be a production manager. So I was overseeing like, uh, you know, lighting sound video for, you know, uh, different venues that were used for, uh, you know, nonprofit events and they had, you know, races and all kinds of stuff they would do that people could kind of use the facilities. So I was overseeing that. And then at the, at the same time, I had been kind of keeping my eye open on LinkedIn for circus jobs. And I remember that there was a circus show that came into town in San Diego when I was a kid called Cavalia, which had a lot of horses in it. And when that show was in San Diego, when I was in high school, I ended up getting in touch with the marketing director on LinkedIn. I just found him. I said, Hey, I want to come talk to your stage manager. He's like, kid, I don't know who you are. You're in high school. I'm not sorry. I can't help you out. I was like, okay, that's fine. But I remembered I had this guy in my LinkedIn and I went to him. I said, Hey, I'm, I have some experience now. I'm a stage manager. I interned with Sir. Here's my resume. Gave it to him. Fast forward a year at this nonprofit. 
I get a random call one night from Canada. I had no clue it was coming. And I was like, who's this must be Cirque du Soleil. And I pick up and it wasn't Cirque. It was Cavalia, the circus company. They said, hey, your resume landed on our desk and we need a stage manager in China in two weeks. Can you can you come to China? I was like, OK. So I quit my job at the nonprofit. I sold my car, got rid of my apartment, sold all my stuff, and got my visa and moved to China within two weeks. And that's what brought me to Asia, and that's what kickstarted kind of the international hoorah. I love it, Dylan. Like, you've got no fear. The growth mindset is, like, next level. Um, you know, there's no second guessing. And you have to put yourself out there. And yep. you have done that time after time. It's very impressive. So you you sell everything. You move to China. You you work on as the stage manager on that show. How long yep. do you stay in China? So that show, I could t when I got there, it was a. I mean, I was making almost no money, but I got free housing. I got free food. I had insurance. What well, I mean, I, I had no expenses, so it was kind of great. And I was working with eighty horses on tour. Um, and I was there for about four and a half months and then they didn't have the next city planned. So I realized that I was kind of, I took someone's job cause they left and there was nothing really lined up for the show after that. So I was kind of not in panic mode, but again, keeping my options open. And then again, weird moment. I remember that my friend from CalArts, one of my student, one of my friends who was in stage management with me at Cornish in Seattle and CalArts, the, the two of us were together all four years of college. I uh, wrote her, I said, Hey, you know, I remember a couple of years ago when we were in college, you went to a country called Macau off the coast of China because your family was there and you saw a really big circus show. Do you think that your family who lives there might have any connection at all? So she does some digging and one of her cousins grew up with one of the stage managers in this small little town called Macau. It's the most densely populated country in the, in the world. And they got me in touch with her. I got this girl's email and I'm in China. And she's in another part of China. And I, I, I said to her, hey, I, I would love to come stage manage. She goes, do you have experience? I sent my resume off to her. She goes, oh, I'm going to give your resume to the main stage manager at the show. Gives my resume to her. A day later, I have an interview. And then a couple of days later, they said, hey, we'd love to have you come out here in a month or two. And the timing worked out perfect. The horse show I was on in mainland China in Shanghai ended. And then I just transferred down to Macau, and that's where I was for uh, three and a half years up until its closure and with COVID. Amazing. Yeah. It's just I, my, my next question is going to be, um, you know, I always ask how important has networking been in your, you know, as far as your success? And <laughs> networking, uh, I think, yeah, I think networks, networking is attributed to a lot of it. I feel like I still had to, I still had to have the drive to go out and look for this random stuff. But then I, I got the job. And it, funny enough, the day I got the job offer, you know, on Facebook, how it tells you things that you talked about five, 10 years, whatever, ever yes. ago. Yes. I think it was probably like maybe seven or eight years before I got the job in, in China, I had posted a video to the trailer of the show saying, I don't know what Macau is, but I would love to work on this show one day. And I was probably, you know, 15 at the time or, or younger and then fast forward. And then there I am working on the circus show, but networking is all of it. And I think kind of just putting your brain out there going, who do I know that might know someone? It doesn't hurt to ask. You know, it never hurts to ask and to go off the networking thing. We'll continue kind of career path in a moment. But one important thing for networking, there was one. I remember I talked with the kids at CalArts a couple of months ago, maybe a year ago. And I said, hey, if any of you are interested in this, let me know. I'll, I'll hook you up. You know, we can figure some things out. I had one student at CalArts reach out to me. He said, hey, I'd love to come to Vegas. I planned a Vegas trip and got him to come sit in the production booth with six different shows in the strip. He got to meet tons of stage managers. He got to network. He got to see the shows for free and he got to learn. And I feel like I gave him the opportunity. I said, Hey, I did this when I was your age. If you, any of you guys are interested, I don't know if it's a thing, but if you want to reach out to me and I'll help you out. I think it's so important to reach out to anybody you might want to work for or work with or learn about because the last, you know, the worst they can say is no or not reply. But if you if you get one good egg and they're wanting to really invest in you, it's it's well worth your time and well worth theirs. 
That's amazing. And w what a way to pay it forward uh, yeah. to give that opportunity to be able to see so many different shows, meet people, uh, you know, the networking it, it firsthand. So um, I love it. So after uh, you're there in China, uh, how do you get to Vegas? So I was in China during COVID. So that was okay. a very interesting experience. However, where I was kind of off tangent, there was no COVID for two years and they locked the area down. So I had a perfect 2020. I, there was no mask. There was restaurants were open. It was kind of a weird, eerie moment, but ended up moving to Hong Kong. I still needed work. And at the time, at the end of 2020, they fired us all from the show. So we had a year in Macau almost just to live there with no show. It was great. And they still paid us. And then when we went to, um, they said, Hey, we're going to close the show. Things are taking longer to reopen than we expected. And I went and got my teaching certificate certification to teach English um, as a second language to students. So I knew I didn't want to come back to America at the time. And my parents were saying there's nothing happening right now. You know, it was, it was late 2020, early 2021. And I ended up getting a job um, as a, uh, as a, as a kindergarten teacher actually in Hong Kong. And I was teaching English at a Montessori school for about six months. Um, and then out of the blue to get back into entertainment, I got a call to come work on expo 2020 Dubai, which is the world's fair. It's the same event that they built the Eiffel tower for in France or built the space needle for in Seattle. Um, and I was doing that event, but in Dubai, it was an 8 billion with a B $8 billion event wow. that the Dubai government put on. It happens every five years. The next one's going to be in Osaka, Japan, but I got brought on as a stage manager for expo 2020 for all of the daily entertainment. And we did 25,000 shows in six months. And um, I had a team of 75 stage managers and we had 25 million people come to our shows over the course of six months. It was the biggest event I'd ever worked on. And I would say probably the coolest thing I've ever done because it's, it's a once in a lifetime. Um, and the site now is being turned into a brand new city in, in Dubai. They're, they're in the UAE. They're really making this whole site that we had into a brand new uh, development. But I was there as a stage manager and it was a short term contract, six months only. Um, that's how long the event was. Um, if any of you guys are interested, like I said, the next one is in Osaka next year. So if you're interested in the World's Fair, it was a life-changing event. Um, I worked with everybody from Christina Aguilera and U2 to the Black Eyed Peas and Dead Mouse and a bunch of artists that came in. Um, we All the countries that had their pavilions there, they brought in uh, daily entertainment from their, their countries, and you know, dance groups and, and concerts. Riverdance, the Irish uh, dance show, did one month of free shows on this huge stage and it was free for the whole audience to come to the whole performance of river dance. Um, my favorite composer, Ludovico Unati was there for the Italian pavilion. It was just a really cool event. And I really do suggest that all of you just go look up expo 2020 Dubai on YouTube later. Cause it's just a really cool event. Um, and then 2030 is going to be in Saudi Arabia. So I know that's also very far, but something to put your eyes on. Maybe you can go travel to Saudi Arabia in, in you know, five more years. There's there's no culture shock that uh, gets in your way. Like you just go do no. it. I mean, but everybody I work with, they've always been. We're all from other countries, you know. And I feel like I've been able to learn so much about people, um, and uh, and cultures. And I think respect myself more and respect others more, and just realize, hey, everyone is different. And kind of coming into a spot like Dubai, where. I mean, my dorm, they put us in dorms. There were, I think, 152 countries represented just in my dorm. Like, that's incredible. It's like the Olympics, but for entertainment. Pretty cool. And then to answer your question about how to get back to Vegas, weirdly enough, my boss from Macau um, at my show called The House of Dancing Water, um, she ended up um, – saying, hey, I'm opening a new show at the Wynn in Las Vegas. Uh, will you come be on the opening team with me? And then she brought me to Vegas to help her open that show and put that show up. So which do you like the best, China, Dubai, or Vegas? Uh, I liked Macau the most. I think it was just a really cool, um, you know, a really once-in-a-lifetime once in kind of place to go to. Um, and get to, getting to live there and have my apartment and meet the locals and become friends with people. I still have a lot of friends who live there. That was just cool to be somewhere for almost four years and really get to settle down and, and have a life in a different country. 
So working in, in Vegas in when do they put you up in the hotel? Uh, are you now at the point where you purchase a home in Vegas? Is this going to be a permanent, you know, cause so the, go ahead. Yeah. So I, I actually am not at the wind anymore. When I started at the wind, um, they did not give us any housing or allowance or anything. So I moved back. I actually took a pay cut and I was like, Hey, you know, I, I, I want to get back to the States opening a new show is a once in a lifetime thing as well. Um, and I opened that show. I was there for a year and it was a six day work week, um, about a 60 hour work week and just a lot of hours and time to open the show up. Do you mind if I, can I show a clip of the show? Yeah. 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 Let me give you a, I want to make so sure open you open up the YouTube yeah, yeah, show yeah. you guys a clip for it. You should be able to share now. Cool. So let me pull this up for you. And then here we go. Um, so let's see, share screen. Um, how do I do this? There we go. Can you guys see the video? Not yet. Might have to click let's share see. screen and then like You're there's correct. a thing. There we go. Well, so are you seeing this here then? Yeah, I see it now. Cool. Cool. So this is just like a, a clip of, um, you know, the marketing clip for awakening, but it's 45 seconds. So here's what I opened at the win. The only thing we can hear is we don't have audio. Okay. Well, I'm just gonna show you the visuals for yeah, now yeah, yeah. while it's watching. Yeah. Um, but this was a, a two hundred million dollar show. Um, wow. and the win uh put this together right after COVID. So they took out an old show in there and we had a cast of sixty dancers. Um and they built the stage out of glass, which was really, really incredible. Um, so I'll go here to kind of show you. But um, the whole stage here is actually made of glass um, and was, I think, 50 million bucks just for the stage. I'm done showing video. Well, can I show you one from Macau as well while we're you here? You can show us anything. Cool. So um, the dancing water. So I wish I had these ready. I would have had them prepared. No worries. They're super cool. So here's kind of a clip. And then we'll open up and go to the good spot. So this is my show in China. And you guys, again, can't hear any of the music, but I'll, I can send you guys links so you can watch it later with the sound if you'd like. But this is one of our shows. We had a giant pool that was the equivalent of four Olympic-sized swimming pools. Um, we had technology and all sorts of stuff in it that was really, really unique. Um, and then I'll show you this, which is pretty cool. Uh, here we go. So here you can see one of our characters in Macau and you can see all the water below her. And there's a character on your bottom left that he's swimming to kind of get her and watch what happens to the stage. Watch all the water closely. It goes from being a giant pool to a solid stage, just like that. Wow. And that was that. So I'm done sharing, but I will happily it's send. It's incredible to watch. Yeah, um, no, I love it. So you're 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 at the win. What comes next? After the win, I was like, hey, you know, I I saw a job opening um, as a promotion to be a general stage manager, which is kind of the head of the team at a show called Absinthe, and I had seen the show a lot, um, and I. Uh, applied and I talked to some people in Vegas and they said, Oh, we don't know who left or why they're changing it. Or, you know, it's interesting. So I ended up taking the job. The show was going to seven days a week and they needed to have a two general stage managers, stage managers to kind of oversee the team because it was a huge operation here um, and doesn't stop. And so I applied for that job and ended up getting it. And the woman who brought me to Vegas, who I was working with at the win was super happy for me. And I think one thing too, when I applied for the job at, at Absinthe in the beginning, I told her the first day I applied, you know, I said, Hey, I'm friends with you. I'm working with you at the win. Um, but I know this town is small, right? People talk. I'd rather you hear it from me. And I just said, Hey, I, I applied. I don't know if I'm ever going to get this or if it's going to go anywhere, but I wanted you to be aware. And long story short, ended up getting the job and I've been here exactly a year now. I just, I started last May. Love it.
Uh, yeah. Amazing. Uh, let me ask you about mentor mentorship. Yeah. Obviously, you are you know spending time with us and 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 mentoring and paying it forward, uh, and you've done that with Cal Arts. Is there a mentor that comes to mind that you have that you can call, um, you know, uh, just for feedback or to run ideas by, or someone who's been in, impactful on your success? I have quite a few of them. There's one that comes comes to mind in Heather, and she was kind of the first professional stage manager that I met. Um, and funny enough, I, I talked to her yesterday, um, and I've now gotten her work as well. I've gotten her some employment for a job in like Prague. She went to go work in Prague for a couple of months. But yeah, she she's just a stage manager, and she took the time when I was 15. There's pictures of me and her when I was 15, and her, you know, just even going to see shows she was working on that I wasn't a part of. She'd kind of bring me up in the booth, or or take the time just to talk with me, or take me to dinner, or introduce me to people that she knew in Vegas. And the guy that she introduced me to in Vegas, he actually ran Absinthe where I am now. This was his trailer, you know, 10 years ago when the show opened. Um, and that, and then also. Uh, a professor from college, um, from CalArts. I, I attribute a lot of who I met um, and what I've done to him. Love it. Is there a mantra that you uh, live by daily or saying that just keeps you focused? I, I, I got an award um, at the House Dancing Water. They made it for me. It's, I, it's awesome. I'm so glad I have it still. It's a piece of glass and it's an etched out trophy. But I got the award for being annoyingly positive. Um, and I think being annoyingly positive is is kind of just something that works really well in theater. I think especially a show like this that's been open for 13 years. Tonight we're doing like show 7,705. We, you know, this, that's a lot of shows and people get tired, you know, and I think people who've been here a long time, everybody has a great attitude, but we all have our days. And I think coming from stage management, we're the bridge between creative and technical and being a positive bridge between those two can really make or break a department. And I think doing my best to always be happy, even if I'm you know, having a rough day, all it's gonna do is make everybody else happy around me. And then that's gonna rub back itself, so. I love it. Absolutely. Any emerging trends that you, uh, you know, do you keep your eye on? Um, you know, obviously, I don't know if AI uh, affects, uh, affects your work, you know, you're, you know, you're, you're hands on in the grind with people. Uh, any trends that you see or follow? <clears throat> Um, I don't think I need to worry about AI. I, mean, I think it's cool. I love putting technology to, to work. Um, how many of your students here are, are in theater? We have some that are interested in theater. We have some that are interested in animation, uh, screenwriting, uh, video game design. Um, cool. Animation, I yeah, we have a, a mix of awesome. everything. That's great. I think one big thing that applies to all of us as artists is, and I learned this, you know, after just wanting to work for Cirque du Soleil forever, is keep your eye on the small guy. Keep your eye on the small companies that are going to grow or might be able to just employ you and treat you really well as an employee, you know, without, you know, like my company here, we have 300 versus Cirque du Soleil that has like 3000, right? It's a huge difference. And, and the care the company is allowed to give to us, it feels a little more like a family than a corporation. And I think that's a really good thing with entertainment. So if any of you are kind of eyeing Pixar, which I love Pixar and love all these big companies, Cartoon Network and, and Nickelodeon or whatever it might be, don't forget that there's also smaller guys to look at as well that might be able to give you a really cool opportunity. I think it's very, uh, very important. One of the other things I want to highlight is the fact that the work you do is very much gig oriented. <laughs> And you're one that is uh, takes that initiative and the resilience to go, hey, my time here might be coming to an end. Got to be thinking about what's the next gig. And I think yep. that kind of really speaks for entertainment. Uh, there's not too many shows that go on forever. Um, and so you, you kind of have to. Uh, see your opportunities. And that's where that networking comes in. And that's where the mentorship comes in and paying it forward. So I just kind of wanted to, to say, highlight that. Yeah. And one thing to say on that too, is um, I have a note in my phone that just says freelance for me to find work in the future. Anytime I meet someone or hear about a production company or hear about an event company that does 
corporate gigs in Vegas. I just put the name in my phone. So when the time comes, I need to go looking for work. I have one spot to go to and know, hey, I want to reach out to these probably 150 people or companies in there now on that list. And I know I have a starting point, so I'm not going to be freaking out if I ever need to look for work really quick. I'll at least have a spot that I know I can kind of begin from. Super, super smart. I love it. Um, let me ask you, what is the biggest piece of advice you would give to your younger self with all that you experienced? Give to myself? Yeah. If you could go back in and just kind of talk to a younger Dylan with all that you've experienced up to this point. Be patient and don't get discouraged. I love it. I yeah, mean, honestly... Yeah, just the fact uh, coming back to your story, you know, a applying for the circ, not getting it, you know, applying mm -hmm. for circ, getting two interviews, not getting it, and then going, ah, it's a waste of time. And then, you know, mom, uh, sometimes moms know best, going like, hey, yeah. just go ahead. What what's there to lose? And 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 your Correct. insight again, also with reaching out on on LinkedIn. Obviously, that's how we touch base. And. Yeah. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with reaching out and going, Hey, I, I'm, I'm, you know, really impressed with what you do in your work, you know, um, how can we work together? So I love that. Um, I want to say Dylan, you are an excellent guest speaker. I want to thank you again for paying it forward, uh, taking some time out of your day. I, I know how extremely oh. busy you are, uh, 24 seven, uh, working on productions. I just want to wish you continued success uh, in your career. And um, thank you again for, uh, you know, paying it forward and sharing such insight and nuggets of information that are so valid and important. Always happy. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to email me. As we conclude another enriching episode, we hope you found inspiration in the stories shared today. Let's take a moment to honor Yes I Can's role in bringing Breaking the Biz to life. Yes I Can's commitment to empowering young people with disabilities through education, advocacy, and mentorship shines brightly, paving paths of opportunity and dialogue. This podcast celebrates the organization's dedication to nurturing talent and facilitating impactful discussions. Breaking the Biz is more than a podcast. It's a part of Yes I Can's broader mission to amplify voices, dismantle barriers, and craft a world that's more inclusive and accessible for everyone. Each episode is a chapter in our shared narrative of progress, education, and empowerment, driven by the spirit of Yes I Can. Thank you for spending your time with us on Breaking the Biz. Continue to challenge the status quo and share stories that resonate. Until our paths cross again, let's keep transforming aspirations into achievements and infuse every endeavor with optimism. Here's to advancing the landscape of the entertainment industry one episode at a time. I'm your host, William Felber. See you next time.